As we get closer to the fourth Bitcoin halving, it's time to talk about what Compass Mining is doing to prepare for the fourth halving. At block number 840,000, we will be at the fourth halving. And what this simply means is that the block reward will get cut in half from 6.25 down to 3.125. The block reward is what the miners get to secure the network. And so to talk about what Compass Mining is doing, I am joined by Chief Revenue Officer CJ Burnett. CJ, how are you? Doing great, Jared. Great to see you. <laughs> great to see you as well. Let's dive right in. The block reward is getting cut in half. Many people know kind of what the block reward getting cut in half means. This is the fourth halving. This for many in the mining industry is going to be their first halving. And so if we could just start kind of right there, what is Compass Mining doing to prepare for the halving? Yeah, I appreciate that, Jarrett. So really supporting our customers through the through the halving is really our core business focus in 2024, right? We think have been thinking long and hard, obviously over the past several months, but even the last year about how do we improve the product that we're offering to our customers, right? So really there are three, three main ways that we are focused on, on supporting our customers, right? One is, as we mentioned before, fleet management. How do we, how do we equip our customers with the tools that they need to manage their fleet effectively? You know, Mining hardware typically obsoletes every three to five years, right? And that's, that's why fleet management is really kind of a core tenant to running a competitive mining operation, right? So, so how do you do that effectively? There's really two main points when it comes to fleet management, right? One is buying new hardware. And the second is, what do you do with your old hardware, right? Uh, on the buying new hardware piece, right? We, we are constantly looking to make sure that we have uh, opportunities in inventory and increasing access to the latest generation hardware. Right. So one of the most popular recent models that have been released is the, the Antminer S21 from Bitmain. So, you know, one of the ways we're offering that, obviously we have that available on our website and we're trying to increase the options as far as, you know, what jurisdictions, what hosting facilities, what price points are, are available to customers. Do you want them online tomorrow versus online, maybe three to five weeks at a little bit of reduced price point. So constantly thinking of ways that we can improve access to that hardware for our customers. If, I would encourage you to go to our website. If, if you don't see something that's uh, on the website that you are interested in, please reach out to us. So, you know, that is how we learn what you are looking for. So please don't hesitate to reach out to our sales and account management team. You know, we're constantly looking for ways to support you better and would encourage you to do that. Um, on, the, on the sales of the old hardware, what do I do with my old hardware? You know, we're, we're also constantly looking at the tools that we can offer our customers to manage their old hardware well, right? So for example, you know, one of the things I take for granted is our hardware marketplace, right? You, you always have the opportunity, you know, if you want to sell an old miner, you can go to your, go to our website and, and become a verified seller on our marketplace and sell your hosted hardware to another customer, right? That, that could be a good option for you, depending on your, you know, maybe your unit's getting a little bit less efficient and, and you're worried about, you know, it's competitive this post having, you can go on there and, and, recoup some of your investment uh, through selling that on the hardware marketplace. So that could be an option for you uh, if, if that's interesting. One of the things that we're also have done to kind of improve the product on the marketplace is, is recently we changed the term length from three years to one year. And what this is seeking to do is, you know, we, we've got a lot of feedback from our customers. Hey, you know, maybe I wanted my NS 19 J pro, but I don't want to commit to a three year hosting term because that's, I don't expect it to, to be competitive in three years, right? So really offering them a, a shorter term option for their hosting contract where they can say, you know, okay, I, I'll mine for it with it for a year. And if, you know, maybe at the end of that time, I want to sell it or I want to take it and take delivery and have it shipped to my house. They have the ability to do that without having to commit to a full three-year term. Um, outside of that, we kind of have, we've recently launched our upgrade programs, which this is really kind of, I would encourage you to think of this similar to, you know, an iPhone trade-in program, right? Every two to three years, you probably, you know, want to upgrade to Apple latest offering on the iPhone, right? And this is an opportunity where you can access the latest generation of hardware at a reduced rate. So we're offering, try to look at your old hardware and we can offer an, uh, a premium to maybe what the, what that unit is worth by bundling that with, a, with the purchase of a new a new um, latest generation hardware. So, you know, I would encourage our customers that are interested in that, encourage you to reach out if you haven't seen seen those. 
communications from our team already. So outside of fleet management, really the second second poor, uh, core point of focus for us is really leading with education, right? We understand that we have customers that kind of range the full spectrum, right? We have really knowledgeable customers that are they're watching every public minor release. They constantly looking for um, you know the latest bay or latest alpha on how they can improve their operation. And then we have other customers that maybe aren't as knowledgeable, right? They 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 are in this to learn. They want to learn about mining. They want want to learn about Bitcoin, and and that's really you know we want to offer those all of those customers the opportunity to you know, improve their knowledge, grow, and, you know, just become a more informed participant in the Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining ecosystem. And then finally, kind of the third third point there of, of what we're doing to support our customers is really engaging proactively. One of the many lessons we've learned over the last few years is, is we, each customer has their own unique priorities and needs, right? It, not, not one solution doesn't fit well for every customer, right? So, Really, really focus on inviting our customers. If you have feedback for us, if you have, you know, needs or, or hey, you want to do, maybe you, there's a type of hardware that you want access to or a different jurisdiction or, or something like that, right? I would encourage you to reach out and, and engage with our account management team. Yeah, we've really invested heavily in our account management team to make sure that our customers are feeling supported and engaged in the process of their mining operation, right? So if you haven't had a conversation with an account manager recently, I would strongly encourage you to reach out so that we can uh, kind of engage in that conversation and get to know your needs better. But all, kind of in summary, those are the three things we're focused on around the having, right? We want to support our customers, giving them the tools they need to operate and, and effectively manage their fleet. Right. We want to provide them with the education so they can be a more informed participant in the mining ecosystem. And then we want to engage with them. Right. We, we want to know what they need. We want to learn how we can serve them better. So that's really what we're doing around the having uh, to continue supporting our customers. Amazing. And you mentioned there and hopefully I get this right the idea of the fleet cycle maturation, essentially, where every certain amount of time, obviously with the having come up, we, we have a timestamp, but it seems like every certain amount of time, you're going to want to update your fleet to make sure it's the most efficient. And this is like we do to two things. The difficulty is increasing as more miners come online. Even in 2023, we saw the overall hash rate double. And the other thing that could play into this is that every eight to 12 months, it seems like there's new miners on the market. So knowing that we're going to have new miners on the market and we do have the upgrade program, thinking about the ones that we're trading in, or maybe some of the old miners, will any miners jump back up in value and profit post having like the S9? Yeah. So, so the last having the S9 was kind of the, the staple story, right? So we had um, prior to the having, or maybe the first couple months after the having, you, you could literally, if you paid shipping, right, you could get an S9, right? They, they were just giving them away or going to the trash heap. So, you know, what we saw after, I would say probably 12 to 18 months post having is the value of those S9s went up to, you know, on the secondary market, anywhere between 500 to a thousand dollars, right? So that's, it's pretty, pretty crazy skew of what those, what those machines did from, you know, trash to treasure, if you will. And we would expect to see some of that in the next cycle, right? There's this dynamic in the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin ecosystem where you have hardware that rack space and hardware is limited, right? So when about mining profitability goes from you know unprofitable to extremely profitable any miners that are in racks or just any miner hardware in general becomes extremely valuable right because the manufacturers the infrastructure um, infrastructure builders they can't respond fast enough this stuff takes time to develop and manufacture right so there there's a really hyper responsiveness to um, to the you know the price in Bitcoin moving quickly to typically ASIC values, mining machine values, uh, going up orders of magnitude past that. And do you think, and this is now just pure speculation and honestly part of my curiosity here, and I'd love to ask you, do you think we're going to see the same just due to the demand that will come back in post having as we get maybe into 2025 when historically it's about 12 to 16 months after the having where we start to see price really start to go. And as price starts to go, do you believe just like you saw, you're saying, you know, in 20 and 2021, we're going to see the demand come back in for those miners? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think we'll see something similar. Um, now, obviously, as you said, it is speculation and, and there's no way to know for sure. But I think one of the dynamics that we have that's a little bit different than previous cycles is we have we have a lot more institutional interest than we've had 
in, in prior halving cycles, right? So obviously uh, this group would be well aware of, of the ETF and, and all of the impacts that that's had. But one of the other things we've had is there's a lot more North American infrastructure already in place or, or people sourcing North American infrastructure. All, in addition to that, there's also a lot more competition on the hardware side, on the manufacturing side. So one of the things you've seen is Square slash now Block. Um, they're, they're in the process of, of developing their own ASIC, right? You have others, uh, Oridine, um, backed by Marathon and others who, uh, you know, they're entering the space. I think you just have this whole supply demand dynamic where, you know, in, in past cycles, it really was just Bitmain, What's Miner and, and Canaan to some extent. It, but now we have the entrance of, of, of several more of several new entrants that are, you know, providing that additional supply to the market. So because of those things, all of that to say, I do think the the um, upside skew in hardware might be a little bit less or a little bit more muted than you've seen in previous cycles, where certainly, obviously, as profitability increases, you would expect to see miners increase in value, right? I would, I think that's, that's obvious, but I do think there is such a degree of more supply of ASICs that as well as infrastructure, I don't think you'll see quite what you saw in the last cycle. Yeah, that makes total sense. And you actually just touched upon something which kind of leads me into my next topic, which what you were just talking about is you were talking about the manufacturing side, right? Of the ASICs, the people who are making the hardware that then are racked, the energy goes in, right? And we start mining some Bitcoin. And I think that one of the things that isn't always obvious, maybe for people on the outside of the Bitcoin mining industry is just how big the ecosystem really is. And for us at Compass, we rely heavily on our partners, our facility partners to make sure that everything is moving forward. You know, that those partnerships are really important. And so how is Compass working with facility partners to prepare for this particular halving? Yeah, that, that's one of the things that I think Compass has has learned in spades over the course of the last three years, right, is, is just the importance of having quality partners and working with them proactively to identify issues, right? So whether it's, you know, hey, hey, there's these machines are having issues or this, you know, our uptime isn't as good as we want it to be. How do we do how do we work with you proactively to remedy those things? So that's one of the things that I think we've done uh, really well over the last couple of years is say, how do we use our remote support teams, our, our remote operations teams, our on-site teams to help go to these sites and say, hey, you have specific issues that you're working through. How do we help triage these in a short-term way and, and set up processes that ensure better uptime for the long haul for our customers, right? So, so that's what we're doing every day, right? Every day, every week, we're meeting with our facility partners saying, hey, hey these are things that we're not doing we're not doing as well as we'd like to do, right? So really working with them and figuring out how do we get to the point that we want to be? Where are we today? Where do we want to be? And how do we deliver that high uptime, right? Because that, that's one of the things that's, you know, of the utmost importance in a bull market is, hey, we just want our machines online, right? And, and so, you know, really working with our facility partners to, to ensure the highest uptime possible is, is our focus. Yeah, clearly our relationships and our partnerships with the facility managers is very important to our overall ecosystem. And as I was kind of saying, it feels like Bitcoin mining is a bunch of people coming together and, uh, you know, uh, rising tide lifts all boats. And going back, I guess, a little bit to upgrading one's fleet, we've talked about that kind of at the beginning here. Aside from upgrading one's fleet, what is something else that customers can do as they think about the halving? And I want to talk about this both in a pre-halving and in a post-halving context, because I think post-halving, there's still some opportunities for people to be able to think maybe differently about Bitcoin mining as we move forward, you know, as we move forward with the next blocks. Yeah, so so I'm, I'm a strong advocate for all of our customers to invest heavily in education, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean paying for education, but spending the time to do the work of what is mining just in itself? What, what is the having? What is unique about the economics of our industry that other industries don't see, right? So many in our space really uh, equate Bitcoin mining to a commodity business, right? What do other commodity businesses struggle with? What, what, is, what are the things that they work through as, as just a, a sheer business, right? Um, and then how, how have, what has been dif the differentiators between successful miners, successful public miners, successful private miners, and those who've ha run into financial issues in the past? I, I think one of the things kind of dovetails into my second point, which is one of the things that you see in spades right now is public miners raising liquidity, right? So they, one of the things about the having that, that is, 
I think really key to understand is you just don't know exactly how it's going to play out. Like 60 days ago, I think um, I had certainly had a different view of what the having was going to look like and how it was going to play out from where we are today, right? The, you know, from the, the depths of, of February with the ETF and the adoption that we've seen there, you know, it, it looks very different picture than where we are today. So the, the public miners, you can see they're really focused on raising liquidity. Some of them are, are selling their, their BTC holdings. Others are, you, you've seen, I think, Marathon and Bit Farms and others uh, go to the market with a, they call it an ATM or an at the money offering to raise liquidity or be able to raise liquidity in the event that, that there's an, you know, a reason to do so. Maybe it's a strategic transaction. Maybe they want to buy more miners or could be M&A, other things like that. So, so, you know, that is one of the things that you see a lot. And I encourage our customers to do the same, right? Post having, we would expect there to be a period of reduced profitability. Obviously the, the, the mining subsidy is, or excuse me, the block subsidy is going to be cut in half. So the, the very, at a very minimum, there's going to be reduced BTC produced. That's guaranteed. We know that. Well, what we don't know is the U S dollar value of the, those Bitcoin that are produced. So, that's why we're kind of very actively going to our customer and saying, just make sure that you're prepared, make sure you have liquidity because you just don't know what that's going to look like post having. Outside of that, I think, you know, one of, one of the things that you see a lot of public miners, I think Marathon's a good example of this. There are certainly others. Clean Spark is doing this, is thinking about what infrastructure means for your business, right? Uh, we do have, you know, we have a whole host. I, I think a lot of people know Compass as kind of the retail face, minimum order quantity of one, right, uh, of mining. But we do have both small and very large customers. And, you know, one of the, we're having, a, one of the things that we're kind of reiterating to, to our customers is the importance of infrastructure and thinking about how does infrastructure fit into your long-term view of your business, right? Do you, do you ultimately want to have infrastructure? Do you not? Um, how can Compass help you in that process, right? So, you know, we're constantly having having conversations with our customers to help them think through that so that they can understand what, you know, obviously they're, you know, maybe they have a hosting term with Compass and they want to, you know, live that out. But what is it, what, post that, what does that mean for your business, right? How can we help you serve post just a, a regular hosting contract? So, um, so that that's definitely something we're thinking about and encouraging our customers to think through. Excellent. And that's kind of in a micro, right? You've just mentioned that we have a minimum order quantity of one. And I kind of want to go up to like 30,000 feet and ask the question, as we zoom out, like, what is the rest of the industry doing? You've just mentioned a couple things. They're raising money. They're thinking about their infrastructure just in, in a different way. I've seen in Anthony... Power's most recent article, he talks about what BitDeer is doing. It almost seems like a vertical integration from everything that they're doing from the physical infrastructure to be able to have some of the newest mining rigs. What else is the mining industry potentially doing right now to prepare for the halving and just beyond the halving, right? Beyond what you've talked about with the block subsidy, with the hash rate increasing, with the difficulty increasing, it feels like this is a great time to get into mining. And it's also a time that's really competitive, but can Competition is a good thing. We know this. Long-term competition is a good thing. So what else are you seeing? Any other trends that maybe you want to call out that are interesting and that you know customers could hear and think about from a more maybe 30,000 foot macro lens? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you use the public miners as a proxy for what the greater industry is thinking, right, which may or may not be the right way to view it, but certainly they're, they're a good barometer. I think the public miners are doing three things. They are upgrading their fleets that every, every week you see a new, a new uh, agreement sign where they're, you know, committing to buy thousands and thousands of new miners, right? Uh, the, the most efficient miners. So that's certainly something they're doing. I, I think it's important to, to view that and look at that and say, why are they doing that? Well, you know, it's because that increases their profitability as a business, right? So that's certainly the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, as mentioned, is liquidity, right? They're really focused on their liquidity, how do I make sure where post having, if there's any reduced profitability, if there's any issues that come up, it could be geopolitical, it could be uh, jurisdictional, legislative, all sorts of things. If any of these issues come up that we haven't haven't planned our business for, how do we weather that storm, even if it's a short term storm, right? So that that's the importance of liquidity, right? Cash is king. Um, no. I know that's maybe not a Bitcoin thing to say, but that, that is. I was going to say, this may be the first piece of Bitcoin content where Cash is King actually makes sense. Because within the context of what you're talking about, I think that was really key. And I think that whether it was a Bitcoin company or any company tied into the blockchain backed ecosystem, we really saw in 2022 and 2023 who had their finances together, right? And so 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. I, I think the a lot of the businesses that went defunct in 2022 and 2023, that, certainly there were bad actors and we don't need really to go into those, but you know, some of them, they, they were good, solid businesses. I think maybe, you know, one that comes to mind is core, right? A Bitcoin miner. They had a really strong business, really strong focus on infrastructure, but I think it was liquidity that, that ultimately was the problem that they ran into. And so that's why you see so many of these public companies doing exactly that today. Their focus is on raising money, making sure even if they haven't raised the money, they have the ability to do that via these ATM at the money offerings. Um, and really just making sure that if they, if something happens that they can't plan for, that they're ready. Right. And so, you know, that's really the focus coming back, really the focus on liquidity, being sure that you're able to act because there are going to be some distressed players. Right. Um, you would expect that. Right. Not everybody has S S21s. Right. Some do have older generation equipment that they might be looking to sell at a discount post having. Right. That could that could become, you know, an opportunity for you to deploy some, you know, some of this money that you have on the side in order to get some of that upside skew that we talked about earlier. So, so definitely something to think about uh, proactively there. And I think kind of the, the third thing that you see the focus on is this, and you mentioned that vertical integration and infrastructure, right? Ver uh, it's kind of the same thing, but really the focus on infrastructure and, and the mitigation of counterparty risk and r how, what does that mean for their business, right? So, you know, I, I think probably the best example I can think of of that um, in the last, I'll call it 90 days is marathon, right? So they've, they've gone out and announced, uh, two acquisitions, or I think one's pending and one's currently, uh, completed on both the, the former generate assets in Texas and Nebraska, and then also the applied digital, uh, data center there. I think they, they purchased that one for 85 million or so. Um, so I, I think that kind of shows exactly what's happening, which is, you know, marathon took a hosted, hosted model for a very long time. Right. That allowed them to scale quickly in a capital light way. But now they, you know, they've also certainly run into issues, but then they've really been focused on how do we go from where they are today to unlocking that next level for their business. And that is them uh, vertically integrating and focus on, on infrastructure. So, yeah, I, I think that's really something to be thinking about there as far as like what the broader industry is doing. Right. So fleet upgrades, liquidity and vertical integration infrastructure. Yeah, I think liquidity is one of the biggest ones there and maybe the ones that's not as obvious as people think about the infrastructure or the vertical integration of the way they're setting up their company. But at the end of the day, a business still needs to have a little money on the side because there's, you know, ra the, the rainy day fund, as you might say. You mentioned something that was interesting and I wanted to kind of go back and it was that, you know, 60 days ago, we were thinking about the having in a different way. And I have to agree, I, I was too. The Bitcoin price maybe wasn't where miners wanted it to be potentially be the overall industry and you know individual miners may have wanted it to be but now that we've seen it kind of increase as we've talked about the hash rate and the difficulty have also been increasing which is has been wild to see because when you see something that is increasing at you know i don't know three or four percent a week that's exponentially that's kind of crazy right so is there something else that could happen you know in and around before the having or post having that would also maybe change your thinking around this having. And I say that because it's not always easy to connect the dots going forward, right? As Steve Jobs says, we connect the dots going back. We'll look back at this having and we'll have maybe all these narratives you pointed out, the infrastructure, the liquidity, the vertical integration when we look back in 2028. But is there anything else that you think that could happen or maybe define the current narrative around this fourth having? I think the main thing that, that we always assume going into the havings is that we expect to see a lot of hash rate come offline, right? Because there, there's always this assumption that there's a there's a large percentage of hash rate that's going to be unprofitable post having, and of course I would expect there to be some some old, very old generation machines that that are um, that are unprofitable post having, right? So call it anywhere between I would say 38 watts of terahash and above, right? That that is unless you have really compelling. Uh, electricity costs, right? I would expect those machines to be unprofitable post having. But the, I think the main thing about this having with with the, uh, you know, I, I think we haven't really seen this as much in, in prior cycles is you haven't had the price run up that you've had here in the last 60 days. And as a result of that, kind of the counterbalance to that is I don't really expect hash rate to come off in a meaningful way post having. You have so many players that are focused on 
finding infrastructure, developing infrastructure, and then deploying the most efficient machines into that infrastructure that, you know, certainly there's going to be some hash rate that comes offline, but that probably is going to be counteracted by all of this hash rate that comes online with more efficient machines, right? So uh, I, I really don't, I think that's kind of maybe the story or the, the expectation that I have around this having that I didn't have around prior havings and didn't have 60 days ago, um, where I don't think hash rate's really going to come offline in a meaningful way over the next I would call it uh, 30 to 60 days. Yeah, I actually completely agree. I think we're going to see something similar, but that's kind of speculative and I don't want to put too much speculation out there. So we'll just have to wait and see. I want to thank you for hopping on and talking through what Compass is doing for the having CJ. This has been absolutely great. And I think there's many things to think about. I'm interested to see how those narratives will play out and then we'll be able to look back on this and, you know, see if that those are the narratives or if they weren't, because as you said, you know, things can change and we're just going to have to see what happens. Yeah, Jarrett, thank you for having me and excited to, to see how the having plays out. <laughs>